and welcome back. We have a very special guest with us, Dr. Andrew Maynard. Today we'll be discussing a range of different topics, including risk innovation, innovation and humanity, and the role of wonder and awe in innovation, but I'm assuming also in life. So Andrew has a range of different titles, author, scientist, the director of Arizona State University's Risk Innovation Lab, among many others. So I'm actually quite interested in hearing how Andrew described himself. So off you go. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, I, it is great to be here. And I always hate that question. I have no idea how <laughs> to describe myself. In fact, I've, I'm so confused. I've actually started calling myself an undisciplinarian because I have no idea which discipline I'm part of these days. I actually, I started life as a physicist, but these days I gleefully cross so many disciplines that if anything, you could call me just somebody who's really interested in where we're going in the future and how to get there safely. Right. Just for the audience. So I came across Andrew's work while Googling interesting books on innovation, right? And I came across his book. It's called Films from the Future. For me, it was like my various interests coming into a joining point intersection because it was about science fiction, films, obviously, and innovation. So I was super excited to have him on the program. So I thought maybe we can start with uh, stepping back and looking at where we are in human history and the meaning of innovation in human history, which innovations do you think have had the most profound impact so far? Oh, goodness me. I, it's such an impossible question because the sum total of where we are at the moment is the aggregate of so many different little innovations. So I'm going to be a little playful, actually, with my response, and then we'll try and get a little bit more serious. Because when I ask this, I usually end up saying, I think the most powerful innovation is actually the pencil, huh. which may sound surprising. But you think about what you can do with the mm -hmm. pencil and what people have done with it in the past and its derivatives and its precursors like chalk and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So to me, the innovation here is an ability to communicate complex ideas. And of course, this is actually a, a driving innovation that has led to a lot of other innovations. But if we couldn't convey complex ideas to other people, we wouldn't have most of what we have around us in the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. So the pencil is indicative of that. The fact that you can take a sheet of paper and you can take take this small device, which doesn't require a battery, and you can write stuff on that piece of paper, and you can translate profound things to other people, whether mm. those are profound things in the humanities and around philosophy, or whether it's calculus, or whether it's the design of a new machine, or it's new technology, or a new science. It is incredible what you can do with those two simple bits of things, those two innovations. I'm now going to two, the pencil and the paper. And the thing that also really blows me away with this is with a pencil, as I said, doesn't require an energy source. You can take it around with you. Once you've got stuff on paper, that lasts a long time as well, actually longer than a lot of our digital media. So that's my playful response. And of course, there are other things which have utterly transformed life, but I'm going to stick with a pencil for the moment. I wonder then what's your next answer right because I read one of your recent papers that you consulted on mm -hmm. which was the scientific American and world economic forums um, right, yes. on the emerging tech of 2021 and plus yep. beyond yes and there were 10 different technologies in there and I was yep. going to ask you which one's your the one that you're most interested in Right. Goodness. And and of course, that means I have to remember what we ended up putting in the 2021 uh, yeah. list, which was, oh, okay, you can go down them. And of course, this is this is actually the, the 10th <laughs> time we've done this. Um, so that there are now 100 emerging technologies that, that we've really talked about over the last 10 years. But yeah, quickly remind me what was what was on the latest list. Okay, you have decarbonization rises. So technology for decarbonization, crops that were self fertilized It was, yes. Yeah. We have the disease analyzers through breathing sensors. Right, yes, the, cool. yes, the breath sensor, so you can really rapidly analyze disease states through breath, yes. Yep, we have on-demand drug manufacturing. Yep. That was pretty cool. And <laughs> energy from wireless signals. Right. Engineering after aging. I'm not quite sure about that. I think that might be a little bit controversial. Right. I'm like tempted to use it, you know, when I'm like 60 or something, but... Right. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, what else? Uh, green, uh, I can't say that word, but ammonia. Oh, green ammonia. Yes, yes. Ways of producing ammonia that are green. Yes. Yes. Biomarker devices go wireless. That's number eight. Yeah. And nine houses printed with local materials. Yeah. Nine. And number 10, I have a hunch, maybe your favorite. I'm not quite sure. Space <laughs> connects the globe. Yeah, actually, it, it isn't number 10, but actually, it's it's a pretty good list. And I should actually say the way we choose these is we look at technologies which are mature enough that they're already having an impact. So these aren't sort of the things that are going to have an impact over the next 20, 10, 20 years. They're already here, but they're nevertheless at the cutting edge. And so in some ways, they're a little bit more mundane than some of the things we will typically think about. But in that list, I mean, there are things that really intrigue me. And it's a combination of thinking about how these will transform lives and the wow factor that isn't this just so totally cool factor. Yeah. And so there are a couple of them, actually, which may surprise you. One of them is the 3D printing houses from local okay. materials. Yep. And I, I like it because in some ways it's a low-tech solution to things. It actually builds on thousands of years of practice around building houses, but it brings in really innovative new technologies so we can use local new materials to actually build housing really fast. Mm. Um, and it's hard to overemphasize how important housing is in the world. We sometimes forget if we're living in a city, especially if we're living in the sort of global West, how many people around the world don't have access to adequate shelter and housing. And this is one way to actually deal with that. And then other ones, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact formulation of it. I mean, there are a couple around sort of drugs. There was one about sort of personalized drugs. Was that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Which is something that we've actually been playing with, with the science and technology for some years now. But one of the things that intrigues me when it comes to diseases is we make a huge fanfares about the diseases we can address. And we tend to forget about the even more diseases that we really can't do much with. And we're beginning to get to the point where it's becoming cost effective to develop therapies for diseases that are orphaned or just sort of get forgotten about. And that really is very exciting where we can begin to personalize medicine in that way. So we actually get to the point where we're not just dealing with the statistical majority, but we can actually deal with the health state of everybody. Mm. Oh, super interesting. Very different to the pencil. They are very different to the pencil. I still like the pencil though. <laughs> for the audience, right? So Andrew has a very broad range of knowledge. And if you read his books, you will understand that he, he can talk about, say, uh, animal park in Russia that's uh, reviving or should I call uh, de extinction? That's where I learned that from. Yes, yes. All sorts of things. So my question then is, do you have a technology in your mind that you are surprised to see that has evolved? Yeah. Surprise is maybe the wrong word. There are certainly technologies that make me pause and think quite a lot. And of course, a lot of my work, and we're talking about responsible innovation, revolves around what can go wrong with technology innovation as well as what can go right. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the really advanced things that are happening at the intersection between gene editing and artificial intelligence, that to me is where stuff gets really weird. And I must confess, half of my brain gets really excited about what I see is happening. And the other half of the, my brain starts screaming, saying we shouldn't be doing this. Uh -huh. So to explain this, start off with gene editing. And we've now got to the point where the precision and the cost effectiveness and the accessibility of how we can actually redesign genetic sequences is such that more and more people can actually start trying to redesign the genetics or the genetic code of living organisms. Now, that's pretty exciting. Until you come to the point where people are talking about bringing woolly mammoths back from extinction or completely changing species. I mean, we're already doing this with mosquitoes, which may sound like a good idea if you change a species of mosquito so it can't carry disease. But what happens when you change the full nature and behavior of locusts, say, for instance, or rats or mice or dogs even? And we're now beginning to do this. We're making this break from our biological, our evolutionary heritage. And that really worries me because we're playing around with things where we're not quite sure about the consequences. But then when you couple that with artificial intelligence, so there's only so much the human mind 
can sort of conceive of and think about as we begin to re-engineer biology. But you give all that over to a trained machine and a machine can do way more, or certainly in the next few years, we'll be able to do way more in terms of completely redesigning species and designing new plants and animals. And we have no idea what the consequences of that are going to be. So those are the sorts of technologies that I think, what on earth are we doing here? <laughs> quite exciting and also really quite scary. So I guess the fact that you have half of your mind is very excited and the other half is very cautious. That's actually a very good balance. <laughs> I guess it is, as long as I can keep my sanity with that, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to bring out your book because I'm going yes. to read a quote from it. So for those people who are interested in reading Andrew's science fiction by book that explains responsible innovation, this book is called Films from the Future, the Technology and Morality of Sci-Fi Movies. And the reason why I liked it is because you were able to express and explain very complex concepts very eloquently. So I'm going to read something you wrote in your book on page 23, which will bring us to our first topic. If we are going to develop new technologies in socially responsible ways, we need to realign how we think about risk with the capabilities of innovations we are creating. Then you go on to write, with emerging and converging technologies, it's becoming increasingly apparent that in order to navigate a radically shifting risk landscape, we need equally radical innovation in how we think about and act on risk. And you call this risk innovation. Yep. Yeah. So I would love to ask you, how is the nature of risk evolving? And what does this mean for organizations or society? Yeah, it's a great question. And it ties in with a lot of my work over the last few years on risk, both conventional approaches to risk and increasingly unconventional approaches. So if you think about, first of all, what risk is, risk means different things to different people and different professions. But usually, we think about risk as a connection between cause and effect. Something happens, or you do something, and something bad happens as a consequence of that. And risk indicates the probability of that that bad thing happening. You also say something about the nature of that bad thing happening. So this is a way that we, we use this concept of risk to make choices and decisions. Should we do A or should we do B? We can work out the, the risks and the benefits of doing each. And typically, we think about risk in this way in terms of what is the probability of somebody dying from an action or somebody getting a disease or being harmed or the environment being harmed or as losing money. Those are usually the categories of risk that um, an organization, a corporation, or an individual will deal with. And over time, we found ways of quantifying those risks. So we quantify that, that cause and effect relationship, and that makes it relatively easy to do these risk benefits calculations. The trouble is those are not the only risks out there. And when we're beginning to look at emerging technologies, we have two challenges. The first is even within that conventional framework, if you've got a brand new technology, because we don't have experience and evidence, it's almost impossible to say what the probability is of harm occurring. We can speculate, but we can't put numbers on it. So we're now in the realm of having to make educated guesses. But we could do that if you're looking at whether somebody's likely to die or be harmed or whatever. However, it turns out that those classical categories of risk aren't the things that often affect our decisions. So if you think about yourself personally, and you think about the things that have the biggest impact on the decisions you make, usually those are things that are related to deeply held beliefs or your sense of self or emotions. This is a little awkward to talk about, but you can think about this in terms of what leads to people taking radical action like committing suicide, for instance? Usually it's not because they've lost money, although that might happen in some cases. More often it's because their sense of identity, their sense of self has been compromised, it's been threatened or something else. And so there's this whole other realm of risks out there. These are social risks, these are personal risks that we don't quantify and because we can't quantify them, we tend to ignore them. But it turns out these are more important than ever when it comes to emerging technologies. 
as an example of that, you look at what's happening around social media and questions about the social impacts of social media. We're now beginning to realize that there are huge challenges around how social media affects things like empathy and empathetic relationships between people's sense of self and self-identity, especially with teenagers, how they actually feel. It's connected with areas such as anxiety and depression. None of these are quantifiable, and yet these are the things that are some of the most important things we need to deal with with social media. How do you begin to have a risk conversation around those sort of things. And so this is where the concept of risk innovation came out, asking how can we think differently about risk so we can actually have conversations about how we navigate new technologies through to where we want them to be. Mm. And I guess the other aspect is, for example, if, if someone dies from using technology, that's most people would argue that that's clearly a bad thing, right? Right. With the new risks... It's also very difficult. There's a more of a debate if something right. is positive or negative. It's not something it is quantify. It's something that requires us to have more discussion. It absolutely is. And it's something that both we've got to come to consensus on as a society, but it also means that it's something that everybody has got a role to play in determining themselves what their personal risk landscape looks like and how they're going to navigate through it. Mm. So how do you think in this context, how would this impact an organization's way of managing risk? Because I guess currently when a big organization thinks about risk, when they introduce a new product, they go to their legal team or compliance team right. and they think, hey, give me, a, give me the line, you know, what can we do? I, I know, you, it, it's really hard to go to lawyers and say, we've got this touchy-feely stuff, what <laughs> should we do about it? Lawyers don't do touchy-feely. Yeah. But it's, yeah, so actually we grappled with exactly this problem. So several years ago, I was working with a bunch of entrepreneurial students. This was when I was at the University of Michigan. And what was really clear to me with these students were, each and every one of them wants to start a new company with a new technology that they sincerely thought was going to make life better for people. This is what motivated them. They, Of course, they wanted to make money because that was the nature of the business, but that wasn't their prime reason for doing this. They wanted to make people's lives better. But it was also very clear to me that most of them were going to fail because they didn't have a grasp of these soft risks, these, these social risks. So we started asking, how do we help these students understand this risk landscape, realizing there are two huge constraints that both these students and when they become entrepreneurs, and you see this in the business world, they have no time and they have no resources. They're all sucked up elsewhere. So that led to a project which is connected with risk innovation called the Risk Innovation Nexus, where we asked the very simple question, if we had 30 minutes with an entrepreneur, what could we do that would actually empower them to make better risk decisions? And we came up with a, a two-page worksheet. It actually takes slightly more than 30 minutes to go through. But all it did was it took people, or it still takes people, through a series of exercises that open up their mind to thinking differently about the nature of the risks they face. And it does that by first of all, asking them what's important to their enterprise. So you're a business, you can ask what's, what are the three most important things to your business, usually beyond just making money. And with a lot of businesses, it is having positive social impact. Then we ask what's most important to your investors, what's most important to your consumers, and what's most important to the communities that you are somehow gonna touch or interact with. And then we ask, what is going to threaten those things of importance? And so you imagine you're the CEO of a company and you suddenly realize that you're doing something which is threatening some area of value to your investors. Now, that's a really foolish thing to do, because if you're upsetting your investors, you're going to lose investment and you're not going to be able to succeed. And if you don't realize that you're doing something that threatens something of importance to your investors, you're dead in the water. So this is a way that we help people begin to just see and think about this risk landscape in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we didn't need to put any numbers or anything on it. Just that process of going through the thought exercise helped people see things that were otherwise obscure to them in this risk landscape. Mm -hmm. So this is how we began to apply it to everything from small businesses to large corporations. Mm -hmm. I thought that was super interesting because I watched one of your presentations and on the graph that you showed, there was something called orphan risks. 
Yeah, often risk. Yes, the, the risks that get left out in the cold. This actually, this wasn't my term. It was one of my colleagues who came up with a term, but we we're trying to capture this idea of risks that are incredibly important, but because we can't put a number on them, we tend to ignore them, but we ignore them at our peril. So we came across this term, orphan risks, because we tend to orphan them. And somehow we've got to learn how to pull them in from the cold and pay attention to them, unorphan them, if you like. Right, right. You just mentioned that you worked with entrepreneurs and businesses. Mm -hmm. And how did you find them using this strategy? It was patchy. <laughs> so <laughs> we had such great plans here and we spent quite some time working with small startups. And what we found was when we brought startups in particular and entrepreneurs in to go through these exercises and have these conversations, they got it. They were excited by how this helped them make sense of things that they were grappling with. They were excited by the way that our process stopped them going down rabbit holes and thinking about a thousand and one ways in which their tech could make the world a worse place and help them focus on just two or three. But then inevitably, we found that despite the conversations being really interesting, they get, went back to business as normal. Mm -hmm. So the place we're at at the moment is how do you take what is clearly a good idea, what clearly resonates with people, and help them codify that into their practices? You see... All of the problems that tech companies are having these days, um, and it's actually frustrating to look at these problems and think, if only they had somebody there who was going through these processes, they could have avoided 90% of those problems. Mm -hmm. I found it interesting because uh, someone who worked on their own startups before, responsible innovation and your risk nexus tools, I find them to be very alluring because I find myself thinking if I had this kind of framework or tools when I was doing my startup, you would have really helped to navigate some of the more difficult questions and decisions. And I know that from my experience with other founders, I mean, there are lots of decisions I think we don't really right. talk about that really can derail a company with very good intentions. So that's why I thought your work in risk innovation was very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting. Good. Yeah. No, thank you. I, I appreciate that. To me, this is one of the big challenges. And one of the things we found, and I, I think that this ties into this conversation, is at the end of the day, people like processes and numbers. So we very intentionally didn't roll those into our methodology. It was a way of getting people to think differently. But because it's just about thinking differently, it's actually a hard sell, even to a CEO who instinctively understands what we're trying to do, but they like to see a process, they like to see numbers. So changing that culture and helping people accept that sometimes it's just thinking and talking about things that reveals the right pathway forward mm. is important. Yeah, I agree, I agree. Now I'm going to change gears. I would like to talk about innovation and humanity. So when we talk about innovation, we often think about a technology that comes out at the end of a process or we think about all the different processes and maybe ecosystem that are involved in creating, say, a product or service. But of course, there's a, another aspect, which is when I think the true value and meaning of innovation really comes to life when the thing that you're producing meets the, the person who's going to use it, right? When it connects. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes. And it's through this co-creation process that impacts come to life and value comes to life. So I'm wondering how can we better understand the benefits of innovation in a socially complex world? Yeah, yeah, I, such an important question and, and so difficult. So just starting with amplifying what you've just said about innovation, to me, this is critically important, not losing sight of the fact that innovation is all about value creation. And uh, for there to be value, there has to be somebody that recognizes that value. So traditionally, innovation is only innovation when somebody is has shown their willingness to actually pay for what you do. But you can expand that and say innovation more broadly is only innovation when somebody is willing to invest in what you do. And that may be an emotional investment. It may be a personal investment or it may be a financial investment or some other form of investment. But there's got to be that recognized value. But then the question is, how do you recognize that value where it's more than somebody just paying for what you do? And there aren't any easy answers there. One of the approaches, though, and this to me is so important, 
is that you only discover where that value creation occurs when you're talking with people and when you're engaging with them. And this is one of the reasons why engaging with communities, whether they're customers or whether they're others, is so critical because that's when you get the feedback. That's when you get the sense of whether you truly are creating something that somebody else is willing to invest in with that. But then where it gets really, really tricky, and I have no answer to this, but I, somebody needs to deconvolute this, is that so often innovations within society where you're getting societal benefit are weird combinations of a lot of different things. And part of the, the root of this is as humans, we've developed this amazing ability to create value from almost anything that's thrown at us. Somebody invents something and someone somewhere will find a way of doing something useful and interesting with it, which means that even bad innovations, someone has actually worked out how to do something useful and good with that. And that's great. That's part of the awe and wonder of being human and sort of what we do. But at the same time, it means that it's almost impossible to point to bad innovations because no matter how bad something is, somebody has worked out how to actually create value out of it. So then the question is not whether people are creating social value, but how much social value. So now we can begin to compare innovations and say, well, that's only got a little bit of social value versus this has got a huge amount of social value. But then how do you measure that social value? And I think that's where people are really struggling at the moment. Then it's the question of different types of values. Is that what you're saying? I think it is. It's different types of values and different natures of values. And sometimes we miss what is important to people and we miss it because of our ideologies. So that, I'll give you a really trite example. And I, I suspect some people will find this a bit of a weird example. But I remember going back to the days when I was working on nanotechnology and a, a lot of my work revolved around trying to understand what the risks and benefits of various types of nanoscale materials were, including their use in consumer products. And I remember having conversations with female colleagues about the use of nanoscale materials in cosmetics. And I remember one of these colleagues saying to me, this is an utterly trivial use. There is no value at all in putting these materials in cosmetics. And so the risk benefit equation is all on the risk side because there are potential risks and there's zero value. What they didn't recognize is to many people that use cosmetics, there is real value to that use because it adds to their personal sense of identity. And so that one trivial example made me realize that value is so much in the eye of the beholder that we run a severe risk if we decide what is of value to other people. But then the only way you can capture that value is getting to know and understand people and really probe and listen to what is important to them. It reminds me of some conversations when you go to innovation events and startup events and you walk around a room and you talk to people and sometimes, you know, you meet founders or engineers who are working on some fantastic product or service, but they haven't spoken to anybody about <laughs> this So what would you recommend? Do you have any comments about that? <laughs> It happens way too often. And of course, smart innovators tend not to do this. So, I mean, if you take the innovation philosophy that incorporates consumer discovery, you're talking to consumers or customers and you, you're developing that relationship. But there are still so many innovators out there that are either so enamored with what they're doing that they don't think it's worthwhile talking to people or they just feel as if they don't have the time or the social skills to do that. And I must say, quite a lot of innovators that come out of academia are like this. They're stuck in their laboratory and they don't seem to think that there is a world of people worth talking to outside that laboratory. The ways to get around that are, in fact, the only way I've found of getting around that is to actually build relationships with those innovators because nobody's going to listen to you unless they trust what you're saying and they trust that you're going to say something that's useful. So for people like me that actually works in this area, I have to build trusted relationships with them. And then there are a couple of bits of advice. One is, if you can, just find a little bit of time to actually talk to people, actually develop those social skills. Or if you really can't do that, hire people around you who can. So at least you've got somebody in your team that can find out what the landscape is truly like. Because the worst possible thing that can happen is you're blindsided by something that you think is wonderful and everybody else thinks is the worst idea possible. Mm. 
I think one of the learnings that I had in my early times trying to develop a company, I made this mistake. I went and developed my fantastic idea. But then I realized talking to people is not just about improving your products or services. It's the way that you talk to people about your product and services. Even the phrases people use to describe what you are doing. You might be talking about the same things, but the very type might be different. So it actually yep. impacts the way that people accept your products and services or understand your products and services. I, I, I think very much so. And of course, part of that is a process of developing trust between you and the people that ultimately you hope will either purchase your product or your services or be part of that ecosystem. And building trust is complex, but it does involve truly communicating with and engaging with people and actually sort of understanding what they're saying and helping them very clearly understand what you're saying so you can actually work together. But it's a skill. I think it's a learned skill. And it's possibly one of these things where you have to make mistakes before you actually get good at it. Hmm. Now, I'm wondering, we're around a little bit over halfway through. Should we go for a fun question before we go? Yeah, go on then. All right. This is this is scary. <laughs> You're pulling them out of a cup. Yeah, I have no idea. What well, there are three here. So maybe you want to choose one, two, or three. Which one would you like? Let's go for two. Two? Okay. I made this just for you because, you know, I was like, Andrew's coming, so <laughs> I have to make it fun. Ready? Yes. If you can science fiction buy a city, what would you do? Wow. <laughs> That's an interesting one. If I could science fiction fire city, what would I do? And I should explain to people the reason why all three questions are science fiction themed because Andrew and I are both like science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be really selfish here and I, I'm going to sort of put, put aside my professional persona of thinking about the good of society. Yeah, and I'm just going to think about what I would really like to see. And I've got to start off with things that really frustrate me living in a city. And I, this is probably colored by the fact that I'm sitting here just outside Phoenix, Arizona, which as an urban area goes, is a real social desert. I mean, sort of mile after mile after mile of sort of urban housing estates. But the things I would love to see in a future city are, I would love to see easy transportation. I don't care whether it's a, a little sort of pod that you call up or something else, but if I need to get somewhere, I would like to get there easy. I would like to not have to drive. I would like to not have to be stuck in traffic. And ideally, actually, I'd like to have to not travel too far. Secondly, I'd actually like to walk to some places. I'd like to be able to walk to places where I can pick up basic groceries. I can sit down with a cup of coffee in a really nice coffee shop. I would like to walk somewhere that's green and full of nature and refreshing. So actually, these aren't big asks. And I would like a city where the house that I live in, it can be small, but it's got to feel as if it's energizing, if it's the sort of place that energizes my soul, even though it's in this big city. So those are actually fairly simple things. And I suspect they're the sorts of things that most people would like. It's very, very hard to find cities that actually comply with all of those at the moment. But they're the sort of things that we can actually build with a combination of smart technologies, but also thinking about the humanity of cities as well. Mm. That's very interesting. I was wondering how you would answer that question. <laughs> right. I, you know, I'm almost tempted to ask what your answer would be. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I thought this, I mean, this was a hard question, right? So I was it like, was. Um, I'm, I'm just going to leave it up to Andrew. I have to have the... <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay, let's go with the third topic, responsibility. As we change and move towards industrial revolution, number four, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What does it mean to be responsible? So actually, this is a tricky one as well, because responsibility is a term and a word that's thrown around a lot without much meaning or thought, I think. And so let me start off with what I mean when I talk about responsible innovation. To me, it's innovating in a way where we're both aware enough of potential downsides of what we're doing, and we're agile enough that if there are red flags indicating that there's going to be some harm from innovation, we can course correct really fast. And the reason I say that is... There's a lot of evidence that we're in a very different era around innovation than we were in sort of 10, 20, 30 years ago. 
And so if you look to the past, we've had this luxury of being able to innovate and make mistakes and cause problems and then get out of those problems with another wave of innovation. But these days, innovation is happening so fast that we can't innovate our way out of one set of problems before the next set come along. And that means we don't have the luxury of making too many mistakes with innovation. And for that reason, and this to me is the main reason, responsibility to me means trying to look a little bit over the innovation horizon and ask those questions. If we do this, what are gonna be the downsides? Who is gonna be affected? How are they gonna be affected? And are there things that we can be doing now to actually minimize those downsides, or at least put us in a position where when we discover those downsides, we can course correct fast. So in that way, responsibility is more about having forethought and foresight rather than saying, let's not do certain things. And how do we have more foresight? How do we do it? A number of ways. And again, it's difficult because you can never predict the future. And this is actually where that term agility is so important. But we can do it by thinking a little bit more. I, this is the low-hanging fruit, thinking before we act. We can do it if we're a company or if you're a company by employing people who have had some training in thinking a little bit beyond the horizon so that they can offer sage advice on what might be a good idea or what might be not be a good idea. And that includes training in things like ethics, where people can get a sense of what public perceptions and public reactions are going to be. We can do it through thinking about um, what we truly want to achieve through innovation. So the first question is, you decide you're going to make a gizmo where you're going to do something, asking who's truly going to benefit from this? Is this just about your ego or about profit? Or is it really about improving society. If you really say you want to improve people's lives, is this really going to do it? And even asking that first question of, is this going to get you to where you want to be? Or do you need to do something else is part of being responsible. And that's again, something fairly easy. But then the biggest challenge is how do you put measures in place? So you're constantly looking for early warnings of things going wrong, so you can course correct. And the two ways to do that, and again, there's a lot that isn't known here, but the two ways of doing that are actually investing in a company in methodologies and people that actually hard bake into the system that level of foresight. So you're constantly checking on what that landscape looks like in the next sort of six, 12, 18 months and making decisions based on where things are going. But the second part of it is making sure that there are people that are trained in responsible innovation and put in positions within companies where they can actually advise on decisions that are being made. So it sounds like, I think when people think about responsible innovations, if you go to someone and talk about responsible innovation, the first thing that people think about is ethics. So these people finish the conversation, go back to their desk, but it's quite sporadic if you approach it that way, right? What you're saying sounds much more strategic. So you are putting strategic thinking behind where your company is going and operationalizing Yep. your vision and mission so that all your decisions are then aligned throughout your organization. So again, it's not just the output of your innovation, but you start from the get-go and everything should be aligned. It's a system approach. That is exactly it. And as well, staying true to where you're going. So going back to the students that I was talking about in the master's course on innovation and entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan, I learned so much from these students But one thing I learned is that it's pointless talking about nice ideas that have no way of being operationalized. So if you're in a business situation, you're having to make hard decisions and you're having to make them fast, talking about ethics doesn't help you at all. I mean, it's important, but you can't make hard decisions just based on ethics, especially when everybody has a different perspective. Talking about responsible innovation actually doesn't help at all because you can talk about engaging with communities and you can talk about words like reflexivity and anticipation, but they don't mean anything at the end of the day when you have to make a hard decision. So we were challenged with how do you actually create an environment where people can make smart decisions that are going to help them? 
and we realized a couple of things. First is, in fact, three things here. First is going back to something I said earlier, that most people in business and most innovators truly do want to make the world a better place. They have this vision of improving people's lives. The trouble is, without training, they lose track of that really fast. The first hard decision that comes along, if they don't have the right people around them or they don't have the right training, they make bad decisions and they slip into ruts of conventional behavior. So the first thing is, how do you train people to stay true to that vision? How do you give them the tools so that they can operationalize their decision-making process so that they stay on track with creating the, the public value or the good that they want to do? Mm. So that's really important. But the second part of it is helping them truly understand that there are things that they can and should be doing to stay true to that vision. So after they've been in business for two years, four years, whatever, they can be proud in saying that, yes, we made mistakes, we learned along the way, but we still still delivered the value that we set out to do rather than just slipping into making profit for shareholders. Mm -hmm. And that to me is more important than anything. And you can actually begin to bring in these ideas of informed decision-making into that without getting caught up in the abstracts of ethics. Mm. And I, I guess that's the world landscape's changing. We already see lots of risks, not just the innovation risks you spoke about before, like the softer risks, but also things like political risks and reputational risks. So I'm thinking having a good discipline within your organisation will actually help you to have evidence to show that you are earning credibility and trust through evidence-based efforts. That is exactly it. And I, yes, developing that evidence base is so important because again, in any sort of business, you can't just make these decisions with no accountability and no traceability. You've got to have some rationale and some evidence, but sometimes that evidence is different to the usual sort of business evidence that you would have. So beginning to have the discipline to collect that evidence or have a team around you that are charged with collecting that and actually monitoring things does become important. Is there a company out there that you think could have benefited? <laughs> <laughs> Many. Where do you want to start? So um, we actually ran a series of case studies in the Risk Innovation Nexus, and we had companies like Thranos, of course, where they just got so sucked into success at any cost that they failed miserably. Mm -hmm. You've also got companies like Facebook, and Facebook is actually, or Meta now, I guess, as the parent company is doing pretty well, but they're having a really rough time with socially responsible decisions that they're making. Twitter, I would say, is another company talking about big companies, especially with Elon Musk potentially taking over. Twitter is on the cusp of success or failure based on the decisions they make and that are going to be affected by social responses. And then there are a lot of small companies. I mean, so even if you're looking at actually I'm small, I'm still looking at large companies, but both Google and Microsoft, there are cases where they've made investment decisions or project decisions that have crossed what some of their employees consider to be ethical lines and the companies have suffered from that. So yeah, there are many, many companies out there that would have benefited from a little bit of responsible innovation hindsight here. Okay. I would like to ask you about the role of wonder and awe. And yeah. it was quite interesting with your first answer with the pencil, because I think when people talk about innovation, they get very excited. And oftentimes it's about the pure technology, what the technology can help us, how fancy it is, how fast it is. But it seems like the way that you are talking about innovation is much more about the actual impact on society and a human program. Yeah. So actually, I would go back a little bit. It is very easy to slip into being very utilitarian and talking about innovation and, and social impact. And very easy to say that the only important thing is looking at, at social impact, whether it's positive or negative. But if we're not careful, we lose the heart and soul of what it is to be human. So if you think about sort of what defines us as humans, and of course, it's not, nothing that's easy to define, but part of that is our creativity, our ability to problem solve, our ability to be awed by things, to be excited by what we discover, to be amazed by the world around us. 
And if we're not careful and we factor that sense of awe and wonder out of innovation, we lose part of ourselves in that process. So to me, it is really important not to lose that, not to lose that capacity to be incredibly excited with what we can do just because we can do it, just because it's amazing. But at the same time, temper that with thinking about what we should do and what we maybe shouldn't do with that. So it's that combination of getting really excited about cool stuff, but at the same time, having the maturity to put aside the things that excite us that maybe aren't the right things to be doing at the moment. Is it an okay analogy to say good innovation is like an athlete, perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, speed and strength and functionality is the muscles and then the values that the innovation brings or impact is actually the values of the athlete and the determination of the athlete. Does that make sense? I think, yeah, there is a lot to that analogy. I like that because you can also say the value also comes in the achievements as seen through the eyes of others. So you think about watching an athletic event. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the participants that get that sense of achievement and amazement from it, but it's the spectators as well. Mm. And I'm not quite sure how far you push that analogy, but there's something important there. It's something that pulls us together and gives us a sense of purpose and definition in life, just watching other people achieve things. Mm. I do not think about that. Right. And I'm not quite sure where you take that. It's probably an analogy that runs out of steam really fast, but I like that sort of, it's almost an empathetic connection. I mean, it's, we're in this together. It's not just individuals doing stuff. Yeah. It reminded me of talking about the fact that innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens within a particular context. So it's almost like a ripple effect. Right. And again, actually coming back to sort of both wonder and risk, that is another aspect of innovation that amazes me at the moment. The world is so small and interconnected that those barriers that were traditionally there just aren't there anymore. Information and ideas and inspiration and empathy just flows at the speed of light. And that is unbelievably incredible. But at the same time, it totally changes the dynamic within which we live. Mm. I'm just thinking, so with globalization, a few thousand years ago, we were all doing different things in our different parts of the world. And what makes Earth interesting was the fact that, you know, if you go to Japan, the houses look different than, say, in the UK or something like that. So I'm wondering, this is not to do with innovation, really, but I, <laughs> I realize that you're very philosophical as well. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. So how can we preserve that when innovation right. is making the world more open, which is great? Yeah, so I, I don't know. I'm not even sure whether there is a problem there or not. I genuinely don't know. And the reason I say that is what I certainly see is ideas and influences spread around the world really fast. But then I see local communities take those and make them their own. So certainly I know that... When I visit Melbourne, it feels different to when I'm in London or when I'm here in Phoenix. When I visit somewhere like Hong Kong or Tokyo, it is very, very different again. And even someone like Tokyo, so I go into different parts of the city, I find those different cultures, those different practices, those different traditions. So I don't get a sense that we're diluting and diffusing that identity. I think the world is just different, but people are still finding their own local identity despite this diffusion, this very, very rapid diffusion of innovation. Now, whether there are problems with uniformity, that there may be other problems still. And certainly there are problems with ideas and behaviors and attitudes spreading very, very fast through the world. But I still think we have an amazing amount of diversity. And I think we're seeing how people are actually utilizing access to other cultures to increase their own identity and diversity. Mm. I think it's time for question number two from the... Okay. You got one or three left. Let's go for one. If science fiction didn't exist, what would the world be like? Really dull. <laughs> <laughs> it's a more profound question, actually, than it might initially seem. Because Thank you. <laughs> we've only really had science fiction as we think of science fiction for the last 100 or so years. But we have had incredible creativity in storytelling. So if you sort of interpret the question as what would the world be like if we didn't have creative storytelling, it would be a 
awful place. I think it would just be like us having a, a social lobotomy where we lost some sense of ourselves and, and who we are. But then with science fiction in particular, I think is important because it takes what we are capable of with our science and technology, and it pushes us towards what we might be capable of in the future. And in doing so, it both inspires us to be different, but it also creates a, a mirror where we can actually see ourselves and understand ourselves better within this technologically very complex world. So I think the world would be a worse place without just science fiction, even if we had storytelling, because we would like that mirror where we can both understand ourselves in relationship to the technology we're developing and the future we aspire to. I want to ask you this question because it seems like lots of scientists and entrepreneurs were somehow inspired by science fiction. And, you know, if we watch the movies from the 90s and 70s and 80s, a lot of those really cool futurist things are the things we have today. I think th there is absolutely a virtuous circle there. And of course, anecdotally, you hear this all the time that scientists are inspired by science fiction and science fiction writers are inspired by scientists. And I know a lot of people who would say, yeah, that's true for me. I'm not sure that it's universally true. And people that have tried to study this haven't found strong evidence for that. But absolutely, some of the most interesting scientists and science around are inspired by what they read from science fiction writers or what they watched in science fiction movies. Mm -hmm. And actually, just this is going off at a bit of a tangent, but to me, it actually really emphasizes the importance of, of creativity and imagination when it comes to either science or technology development. Mm -hmm. The most boring scientists in the world, and there are some boring scientists in the world, to me, have no imagination. Mm -hmm. They're just sort of joining the dots and sort of turning the handle and producing knowledge without really understanding of the awe and wonder there. Mm -hmm. The most exciting scientists to me, and this is actually the majority of scientists, are the ones that just have this incredible imagination and creativity. They had the rigor to do the science, but they're driven by this imagination of what the world could be, what they might discover around the corner. And that to me is where science becomes so exciting, but where it needs that inspiration of art, art in the form of science fiction, but actually other forms of art as well. What I realized while reading your book was that I think I was a little bit opposite to you because you said you loved science fiction books, but then got into science fiction movies with 2001 Space Odyssey, correct? Yes. Well, I was the other way around. So I've always been really interested in films. And then I only realized very recently that all of my favorite films are science fiction films. Which films? One of them is in your book, which is why I was so excited. Contact, of course. Classic. Yes. Oh, yes. Classic. And the, a more recent one was Arrival, which is quite good. Mm. And her, but I think Contact, which was just something about it. I think it has to do with wonder and awe. It absolutely does. I've got to tell you, out of all the films in the book, the chapter on Contact was the one where my editors came back to me and said, are you really sure you want this one in the book? They said, it, it just feels too fantastical. And that was the one that I insisted absolutely had to be in the book because to me, Contact is a love letter to science. It's about the awe and wonder of science. And I just could not not have it there. And I think the reason why I got your book was purely because I was like, okay, film innovations together, right? I didn't realize Contact is in the book. So I was reading right. Jurassic Park and Transcendence. And then I realized, oh my gosh, my favorite film is the end of the book. So I was super excited to reach that at the end. Oh, um, yeah, but <laughs> contact for me was about connection. I don't want to say too much for those people who have not watched it, but basically it's about connection and empathy and totally different groups of people coming together. And for me, that comes back to the wonder of innovation, of maybe even science, is that if we do innovation correctly, quote unquote correctly, if we put thought into it and purpose into it, then innovation can really connect humanity in a way that we can actually unite and build a really great future I so agree. yeah that that's my favorite film but well, we have mm -hmm. not finished yet uh, we still have a few questions to go yes. okay we spoke before about a few questions i wanted to ask you and one of them is tell us a story only you can tell right so i was wondering which story to tell here. I keep this to the professional sort of side of my life. I've had a really sort of interesting convoluted career. I would have never 
thought when I was doing my first degree in physics that I'd end up doing what I'm doing now. But there was a pivotal point in my career. And it was actually only, what, 15, 17 years ago. So it was a point where I was a laboratory researcher working on nanotechnology risks for the US government. So I was deeply steeped in my lab. I love my lab. But I was also doing work for the federal government in DC. And I went on a trip to DC one week. I was actually working in Cincinnati. So this was a flight out to DC. And I was at this meeting and I sat down next to this guy who I knew vaguely and he leant over and he said, we're starting a new project here in DC. Do you want to come and join us as our science advisor? And I thought this was the biggest joke ever. I was a scientist working in the lab. So I flew home that night and said to my wife, really funny story today. I just thought it was a joke. I said, I was offered a job in Mm -hmm. DC. And she said, that sounds really interesting. And it was the only reason I took the job. And the only reason was because she said, that sounds interesting. Now, this job took me out of the lab and it placed me in a position where rather than doing lab research, I had to talk to journalists. I had to talk to policymakers. I had to give congressional testimony. I had to talk to non-government organizations. I was scared out of my life, literally scared out of my wits for the first two years because I had no training in this. But it was that experience that made me realize that if we're actually going to build the sort of society that we want in the future, especially with advanced technologies, we've got to do things very, very differently. We've got to form these connections and these associations between all these different stakeholder groups. We've got to have ways of helping people understand what the technology is that's coming along in words and phrases and forms that actually make sense to them. We've got to help them become co-creators of this future. And so it was that experience that completely changed the trajectory of my career from then on, completely changed how I think about innovation, completely changed the research I do, how I communicate with people. It actually led to me um, writing books like Films from the Future. And it was all because of me sitting down next to this guy and him saying, do you want to come and join us in DC and me thinking it was a joke? (laughs) So then if you look back before that decision and afterwards, what do you think you learned about yourself? (laughs) So I, I learned so many things. I learned that I was better at doing some things than I ever thought. So I'll give you another example. I was always really bad at writing. I go back to high school. I nearly flunked my writing exams at at high school, which is incredible when you consider that I'm now an author. But actually, there's a dirty little secret here. I actually think that over the years, I've become a really good communicator because I recognize my limitations early on. I realized I was actually a really bad writer, so I had to work really hard at being a good communicator. But that's one big thing that changed. And there are many other things, including sort of working with journalists, because this is not something that's ever taught you as a scientist. I had to learn how to work with journalists. And then even more importantly than the journalists, working with civil society. So working with groups like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace and others, which became incredibly important to me. But again, it was not something that I'd ever even thought about before. I'm super surprised to hear you say you weren't good at writing because I mean, honestly, when I was reading a book, I was thinking, wow, I don't know how you were able to string complex ideas into such an easy way, because I'm not very good with writing, you see. So I'm hoping that there's some more hope for me. (laughs) I'm sure there is. And so the little secret here is I have never met somebody who I would consider to be a good writer who hasn't said it's incredibly hard work. And so part of it is beginning to realize that everybody finds it difficult to write well. And then the other part is anybody that studies my writing closely will realize that I don't use long words. I don't use long phrases. I simplify things down. It's not because I'm a good communicator. It's because I'm a bad writer. So I have to keep things as simple as possible. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. So is this story the same as the important lesson you've learned? It, It folds into the important lesson that I've learned. Probably one of the most important lessons, and it it does tie into this, is recognizing that the only way of actually helping people to be part of building a better future is to focus on empowering them. So when it comes to the way that I communicate, actually, I should take a step back. So I'm an academic. I do research. I 
develop new knowledge, I develop new insights. But one of the realizations that came to me, especially through this transition, is that all of the research that I do is worth absolutely nothing if I can't get it out of my head and into the heads of other people in ways that they can use. And the only way to do that is to forget about any ego on my side. So communication now becomes not about me. I'm not important here. It all depends on how effectively that information sits in somebody else's head and hands in a way that's meaningful to them. So now when I sort of think about communication, when I communicate, it's all about the audience and the best possible interview, including this one, I would say, is an interview where nobody remembers me, but they remember the ideas and they think that's something I can take away and use. And that actually was a transformative step in how I began to think about the work I do and how you actually get it into other people's hands. We have one more question left in here. Okay. 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 Number three now. Actually, it links quite well with what you were saying before. So for everyone who don't know, Andrew actually has two books already out. The first one is the one I mentioned before, which is called Films from the Future again. And the second book is called Future Rising. So if your third writing project were to be a science fiction book or a movie, what central topics would you want your main character to explore and why? Oh, that's a good one. And I hadn't thought about this before, but it wouldn't surprise you to know that I'm beginning to play around with ideas for my next book. I'm not quite sure which way it will go, but one of the potential ways is thinking about what it will mean to be human in a technologically complex future, probably about a hundred years from now. So if I take that theme and sort of think about a movie, it's a theme that I would love to explore in a movie in a way that, that other movies haven't. Um, thinking about how the technologies we're developing at the moment potentially completely transform the nature of what it is to be human and what sort of future society that would lead to, whether it leads to complete changes in what we consider to be morally acceptable or unacceptable, whether it leads to changes in our levels of tolerance and acceptance and celebration of difference, or whether society all sort of collapses down into everybody being the same. So that's a central theme I would probably have in my, my movie. And I'll probably sort of craft something around tensions, because there've got to be tensions in movies. Tensions with a future society where people can actually design who they want to be in a way that has never been possible before in human history, and how that leads to tensions between people who look for conformity versus people that look for diversity within society. And then, then I've no idea where it goes. I've no idea what the plot line would be there. I'd love to read it. Okay, so the last question is connected, actually your vision for 2050? Yeah, and this was such a hard question because my crystal ball doesn't work that well, but I can talk about the things that I would like to see. And actually this sort of ties into the work that I do very much. So I would love to see in 2050, a world where we're still embracing technology innovation. We're excited about what we can do with technology, but we've reached that level of maturity where we can guide technology innovation to growing really substantial social benefits for as many people as possible. And so to explain that, a lot of what happens with social benefit and social value at the moment with technology innovation is somewhat accidental. Somebody comes up with a new idea and somebody else decides how they're going to find value there. Wouldn't it be great if that was more intentional? So we can actually find a way of steering technology innovation less towards making money and more towards truly empowering people to live the sort of lives they aspire to and be the sort of people they aspire to, not only in mainstream society, but especially at the margins of society, the communities that, that tend to get left out. And as part of that, and thinking about this world of 2050, something that I think is going to be tremendously important then, and something that I'm working very much on now, is the question of how do you empower everybody to be part of building this future. So the power is not just in the hands of a few entrepreneurs, or it's not just in the hands of people that have got PhDs from prestigious universities, but anybody that has the desire and the will 
can be part of building this better future, which means that they have access to the knowledge and information and skills that they need, not by going through formal classes, but going to online sources, that they have the ability to be part of communities that allows them to put that knowledge into practice, that they can be part of society-wide discussions about what is good for society, what is bad for society, where we want things to go. So everybody now becomes part of co-creating the future that they aspire to. So that's, it's a bit wishy-washy, but that's the sort of future I would love to see. And that's where coming to the present day, I spent so much time and effort working out how do you make sure that knowledge and insights and information is as accessible as possible to people so that they can see their role and their place in building this sort of future? Well, thank you so much for your time, Andrew. I absolutely enjoyed this interview. Well, same here. <laughs> I really hope that in the future we will get to have another conversation about all things and hopefully your new book. <laughs> we'll see. Yes, it might be a year yeah. or so yet, but it's definitely in the planning. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you everyone else who are listening to. And I hope to see you guys as well soon. Thank you.